Hello, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session is on astrophotography tips for beginners. And um, for a lot of people in the room and a lot of our usual viewers, this might be uh, very beginner, and we've done stuff like this before. But I'm kind of keeping it concise, and it should be relatively quick. I don't want to overwhelm anybody, um, whether it be with complex information or a video that lasts an hour and a half. So uh, it should be easily digestible. And <laughs> sorry about that dog barking. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, well, it is what it is. Um, we're going to have an image of the week for next week. We do need your submission still until we change the way we do this, but uh, keep that in mind. Oh, my goodness, my dog's going to drive me nuts. If I disappear, I'm going to let him out. Um, ugh. I just caught my big dog outside the fence. He, he escaped somehow, so uh, fortunately I got him back in. Um, okay. So uh, you're looking at my uh, screen share here, and I'm going to jump right into the presentation. I'm sorry. I'm, I've got to let my dog out or else this is going to drive all of us nuts. Uh, tips for beginners. While you're... Where we? There we go. Well, while you're gone chasing your dog, Adam, okay, yeah. you go ahead and enjoy your, your dog. Hey, I want to remind you guys that we do have two ways for you to enter questions. And this is the kind of topic that should bring questions from you. Uh, if you're in the room, you can enter them in, um, in uh, the comments section over here. And the Q&A section, I believe, if you're in the... Um, in the group chat is where you do it if you're in the in the room. If you're listening over on uh, YouTube, then go ahead and type them into the Q&A sections down there. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can, and usually we do get to all of them eventually. So type things in. If you've had got any comments, if you wish to correct Adam, feel free to do so. I know that you know he's been a long time since he's been a beginner. He's forgotten a lot of this stuff. So uh, go for it, Adam. You're back for the doggy. I'm back, yes. Uh, thanks, Alex. And one more thing I wanted to mention is next week is NEEP. Um, so I'm probably planning, uh, assuming everything goes as planned, I'm probably going to do something that, uh, just kind of a recap like we did last year. Um, it may not be the most thorough presentation because I'm going to have to put it together between the time I get home and the time we go live, uh, which will give me about two hours, if that. Um, but yeah, you'll you'll get to pretty much visit Neef without having to go. Uh, that said, if you're in the area, Neef is awesome in Suffern, New York. Um, if you're within a couple hours, it's definitely worth going to. Uh, you're gonna see all the new astronomy gear, some old astronomy gear. Uh, pretty much all the major vendors are there. Uh, it's the big East Coast show. Uh, so, to the pre and if you see me, pull me aside. Let's chat about astrophotography or whatever. Uh, even just to say hi. And it might actually warm up by then. Woke up with three inches of snow this morning. Ouch. Uh, hopefully it'll be melted. I think it's going to be 55 degrees next week, uh, Sunday of next week. And uh, for some reason, the solar star party always works out. It's always clear. Here's hoping that works out this year. Tips for beginner astrophotography. More, better images. Um, and I, I start off more better images because that's basically the plan. You want more images, you want better images. Uh, you want to get in as much imaging in the clear sky time you have. Uh, we don't all have great skies, so we do what we can with the skies we have. Uh, so, and now my dog's scratching to get in. If, if I go, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna break for questions in a little bit, and then I'll let him in. Um, but um, to start off, uh, start small, start smart. And uh, the point of that is uh, don't buy the biggest and best right off the bat. Uh, we all have a tendency to uh, get into something and say, well, you know what, I've got the money in my pocket. I'm going to jump in and buy this, and I'm not going to name names or name mounts or name telescope manufacturers. Uh, but because in some cases buying a more expensive item uh, isn't necessarily a bad thing, uh, but there are other cases that it can get you in trouble. Uh, and, and the point of that is complex systems are complex. There are mounts out there that may be a little bit too complex for a beginner to understand. Uh, you, you don't quite know what questions you have to ask. You may not know the terminology. Uh, so in some cases, having a simple system might be the best. Uh, at the same time, wide field scopes aren't for wussies. 
And I say that because when you go to buy your first telescope on the internet and you look at the picture, you uh, don't really have an idea as to how big it is, how long it is, how heavy it is. And that's really important. If, if you can't carry, well, you going down, you cannot use what you cannot carry. And uh, there, I have this telescope that I want in my head, but I'd probably need a friend to help me mount it. And that might not be so practical because heavy systems are heavy. And uh, 50 pounds is a lot to get up on your shoulder, get onto a mount. Uh, while you're holding it, tighten it down. Uh, you know, I might be able to do it, but at the same time, I might drop it. And I don't want to do that with a with a two or three or four or five or six or seven thousand dollar telescope. Um, so make sure you look at the weight of the items you're buying. Don't just pay attention to the sample images. In fact, the sample images are not really representative of what you're going to get right off the bat. Uh, it's more about the time you're willing to put into learning what you're doing. And uh, for those of you who are coming to astrophotography from visual observing, they're very different. Um, ask your questions because you really are planning a system. Uh, a 12-inch daub, a 16-inch daub uh, is a terrible system for imaging, but it's a great system for visual observing. So keep that in mind. When you are buying your first system, read the manuals. Before you buy it, read the mount manual. Make sure that the mount, uh, make sure that it makes sense to you. If you don't understand the terminology, read about the terminology. Uh, I always joke that a good book, you do let, when, you, when you're reading a good book, you end up not reading the book so much. You go off on a tangent. You read the paragraph, and you're like, wow, that's interesting. Let me read about that. Then you go back to that paragraph. It's kind of the same way with astrophotography. You're reading about a mount. You read about PEC. Well, what's PEC? Oh, PEC is cool. Well, let me look into that. Well, what's, what's this? What's that? So you really want to read the manuals and understand the terminology. That's one of the ways you're going to learn. As I said, uh, small scopes. We say this all the time. Start with a wide field refractor or a lens. And if you have the lens, then that's probably a pretty good start. If you already have the DSLR and the lens, hey, I know what I would suggest starting with. But keep in mind, there are good targets for every scope. And that means focal length and, uh, well, a small lens, there's lots of good targets for a small lens. If you have a wide field refractor, there's a lot of good targets for a wide field refractor. If you have a really big, long focal length scope, but one that magnifies a lot, um, it gets more complex, but there are good targets for that. And in general, focal length and sensor size determine the field of view. And that's our primary concern. What is the field of view we're looking at? And if you look at this beautiful galaxy Andromeda on the right here, uh, I've said this before, probably with the same image. Everybody looks at this and says, wow, you must have a telescope that magnifies a lot. And, uh, well, no. This is a small, wide-field refractor. This is a great telescope to start with. Bigger can be better, but not always. It depends on your target. Wide-field refractors, lenses, they don't require the most expensive mount, the heaviest mount. In fact, a small telescope can kind of fit on a small mount. And these things do get heavy, uh, the mounts as well. Um, there are mounts that weigh 10 to 15 pounds, not including the tripod. There are mounts that weigh 30 pounds. There are mounts that weigh 50 pounds. There are mounts that weigh uh, 200 pounds. So uh, make sure you pay attention to that. But a wide field refractor, it's easier to learn with. Uh, it's more forgiving, and there's a lot more that you're going to be doing than just acquiring the images. You're going to be doing processing. And if you are not getting good sub-exposures, which I'll explain a little bit about, um, you're going to have difficulties processing. You're going to have difficulties learning about processing. So start wide field. Don't make the mistake that I made and bought the biggest scope and not necessarily the best mount right off the bat. Um, start with the wide field refractor. Get your great images right off the bat. I spent a year and a half using my big SCT, and then I bought a wide field refractor, and I just kind of surprised myself. I said, why are my wide field images so much better than my SCT images? 
Well, it's because it has nothing to do with the scope. It has to do with uh, using using your system properly. And remember the mount. Well, first of all, after you you're going to read that mount that manual because you really want to pay attention to the mount. The mount is the most important item you will buy. You have to look at the weight, as I said earlier. Look at the capacity. That's how much can the mount carry. With many mounts, the capacity is rated for visual imaging. So us image, uh, visual observing. So us imagers, uh, we usually split the capacity in half. If a mount's rated for 30 pounds, figure you can image nicely with a 15 pound scope. That scope camera put together. Again, read the manual. Look at the polar alignment routine. Make sure that makes sense. You're going you're gonna to have a few things to learn, and you're going to learn a lot from the manual. You're also going to learn a lot by asking questions. The manual is going to give you the questions to ask. Uh, you're going to have to find some people to ask questions, and I even have a slide about that in a little bit. The histogram. When you get into imaging, the first night out, you're going to put your camera on there, you're going to snap your first exposure, but then you're going to think about it. Well, what's my exposure time? And the histogram is what explains to you your exposure time. And if you look at this um, histogram on the left, it's basically going to look like the same histogram you're going to get on the back of the camera. If you have a, if you have a DSLR, you're going to hit display a couple times. Uh, a Canon DSLR. I'm not quite sure what it is on a Nikon, but it's going to show you the histogram, and that histogram is actually more valuable when it comes to figuring out your exposure length than looking at the back of the image on the back of the camera. Um, so you want that histogram spike to be separated from the left side, and you can see there. There's just a little bit of spacing between the left side and where that histogram lifts off the left side. That means that your object signal is coming off the background. And that's very important when it comes down to the nitty gritty of separating the signal from being buried inside the noise that the camera naturally provides. If you can't go longer, remember with DSLRs you can increase the ISO. That's only up to a certain limit. And um, when I say up to a certain limit, well, I'm going to say, this is a very general rule of thumb, it may be different, but 400 to 800 ISO is probably a good place to start. And after those, you can go up to 1600 with some cameras, but for the most part, you're going to be within that 400 to 800, possibly 1600 range, and the rest of it is going to be done with exposure. So remember, the way to separate that spike is to lift your ISO or increase your exposure. The limit to increasing your exposure is how long you can expose while still maintaining round stars. So that's the balance. That's your primary balance. You're going to look at the back of the camera to see the histogram. You're going to look at the back of the camera to see how round your stars are. If there are lines, well, you have to back off the exposure and increase the ISO. That's very generally what we learn from the histogram. Integration time. So you've got your histogram separated from the left side. You figure out your ISO. You figured out your exposure time. Well, take lots and lots of those exposures. Don't settle for one. Take 50. Take 100. Keep going. You'll see at this on this uh, image on the left here, a single frame has a lot of noise in it. But if you stack five frames, you're going to get uh, a little bit less noise, a little bit more signal. Well. A little bit less apparent noise, let me say here. Uh, the signal is going to start to grow, and the signal is going to start to separate from the noise. 15 frames, even more so. 30 frames, even more so. The pros, and who's a pro in this hobby? Well, I don't know. I, I could name names. I won't name names, but the guys who are doing it well can spend 40 hours on a single image, and uh, that's just the way it is. Good images take time. Um, I think I have a slide on this, but I'm just going to come out right out and say it. You cannot no, you cannot reduce the noise on a single frame in post processing and get a great image. It's more about increasing the signal. Uh, that's what that's our primary goal here. Calibration frames. Learn how to take calibration frames early on. Darks and bias frames are easy. 
flats, flats, flats. I repeat it three times because flats are important. They're a bit more difficult and they can, I, I'm going to say they will improve your image more than any other calibration frame. I like to say that flats really do require bias frames to get the math easy, uh, to get the math right, but um, darks and bias frames are really easy. You can do it, you can take darks and bias frames at any time, you can reuse them, but flats you really should take if you're portable on the night that you imaged your normal subs or your lights, which are what we call normal sub exposures. You can take flats with a simple t-shirt, you can do it at twilight, you can use a flat box, you can use a flat panel, basically a flat is um, and, and I'm not going to go into how to take flats, but basically a flat just helps uh, calibrate your image so that it knows the differing illumination of your optical system. Um, most optical systems will be darker in the edges and brighter in the center. That's what we're trying to compensate for. And uh, when you're processing, it gets very difficult to process that out. If you take a flat frame, then it's going to make your life so much easier. And it's one of those things that everyone, you, you'll see beginners, uh, you'll see intermediate astrophotographers, and they hate flats. They're, oh, I'm not ready to take flats yet. Wow, I mean, they really improve your image so much better than any other learning of processing or any other steps you could take. I'm going to take a quick break right now. You guys, ask your questions, and I'm, I'm going to hear you ask your questions, but I have to let my dogs in again. Uh, sorry about this again, but uh, if you have any questions, ask them now. I'll be right back. Hi. I asked a question. Um, earlier I said, what's a wide field scope? On the first uh, slide or so, Adam was talking about um, uh, wide field scopes are for wussies, as if they were something you should avoid. And then shortly thereafter, um, there's another slide that says, oh, yeah, you start with the wide field scope. So I don't know. Adam's probably back, and so he's listening to me complain about whatever it was. Adam, what's a wide field scope? You back? Yes. Okay. Yeah, wide field yeah. scopes aren't for wussies. Um, so a wide field scope, it's hard to say exactly what a wide field scope is, but I would say a wide field scope is a refractor that's 80 millimeters or less. Now, there are wide field reflectors, but um, they tend to be more difficult. Uh, Newtonians can be wide field reflectors, and they have their own issues. Uh, there are, uh, what are they, Riccardi Hondas are wide field reflectors, uh, which are very expensive. Those aren't really beginner scopes. So when I, when I say a wide field scope, I'm thinking a small 80 millimeter or less Refracting telescope. Okay, uh, now they're they're for th those are what I would. I mean, my TV eighty five is a wonderful beginner scope. I'm you. I'm you. You know what? If you if you want to correct me and say eighty five or less, I'm no. perfectly fine to say that. Uh, oh, oh, okay, but but you said they're for wussies. I don't, I don't get it. Uh, and then no. in the next slide, you said start off with a wide field refractor. No, uh, wide field scopes aren't for wussies. Are you, do you see my slide now? Yeah, okay, I see your slide. Okay, no, no, I, I think what you mean is the big fancy ones, uh, the Ricardo Hondas and the and the um, you know the the ones that are really made, you know, the real fancy ones, the ones that try to get the uh, the the Schmidt cat. Well, there aren't any Schmidt casts in that class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not for somebody to start with. I would think that uh, long focal length lenses are not the ones that are. W are not for wussies, but a good wide field scope like a TV 85 or a, you know a 76 millimeter TV. If you put out a 76 millimeter, those are um, wonderful scopes for somebody to start out with, and they're wide field scopes. Now maybe it's just the question of what you mean by a wide field scope, because in the next slide you say wide field reflectors are okay. Yes. Okay. See what I, I mean? Yes. Okay. So I I think that. Uh, Okay, so here's where I'm coming with that, uh, from with that. Um, I think that for a lot of people that come at it from maybe a visual, set, a visual observing perspective, 
they think they have to have the biggest scope or the most magnification to right. take good images. And that's kind of where I'm coming at it from. They all start off with that big Schmidt cast. And yes. Because that's what they're going to get. But I wouldn't consider a big Schmidt cast a wide field scope. No, no. No, in fact, uh, a Schmidt cast probably isn't a good starter scope yeah. for a number of reasons. But I think okay. people, I think people, okay, so maybe this is just me. Uh, you're, you're, uh, let me think, I, I, I'm trying to think of a, a non-astronomy example. Um, you know, you want to buy a really fast car, and you're, or maybe you want to buy a really fast race car. You want to drive really, really fast. Well, you could buy a Ferrari, right? But, yeah, I can. No, I can't. Do <laughs> you or you can't? But are you really that good of a driver that you're going to get the most out of it? Sometimes yeah. not having that really big scope. There's a lot more to learn about it. Yeah, I sure. Got, okay, okay, I that's the point. The big fancy scopes is what you're talking about. When you say on that first slide, wide field scopes aren't for wussies. What you mean is the big fancy scopes that you might someday have. Yes. Is not where you start off. Yeah. Don't don't think you're don't think you're uh, wussing out because you bought a wide field scope. I guess that's the way of putting it. Um, I remember this, uh, uh, I, I can't remember his name, but he did a, on YouTube, he shows a C14 and he's mounting it on his mount and he's having trouble getting it mounted on the mount. And I just think to myself, you know, uh, for us imagers, we have it easy. We can get great images from wide field scopes. You don't have to you don't have to buy the biggest right off the bat. Hey, if you want to, buy the biggest right off the bat. Uh, but just keep in mind, you might get a better image out of the wide field scope. And uh, hopefully hopefully that explains it well enough. I don't know. Okay, I, 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 I see. Wide field scopes aren't for wussies. That, I was taking that to mean that you should avoid wide field scopes. But what you mean to say there is something to the effect of uh, just because you got a wide field scope doesn't mean you're a wussy. Exactly. Exactly. That's not what I was reading on it. Okay. Is that wrong? Was that fun, everybody who's a beginner trying to listen to what this was about? I'm <laughs> going to mute myself here. <laughs> Thank you for delaying the time while I let my dog in. So, um, okay. So integration time, calibration frames, darker skies are best. You know, I've been I had been imaging for about a year, uh, going to club meetings, showing off all of my. Uh, all of my uh, photographs to the guys. I thought I knew what I was talking about at that point. And one of my club, one of the club members, um, I was really excited to go out the next day. And one of the club members said, "You know, the it's a full moon tomorrow." And I said, "Yeah," and uh, and I said, "Yeah," but I'm still excited to go out. And he said, "Well, it's not great to image during a full moon." I didn't realize how much of an impact that had. Uh, so dark skies, whether it's driving to darker skies or Avoiding the moon, it's best to shoot in that manner. Uh, I have one major exception to that. Your first few outings, or when you're testing new gear, do it from your driveway no matter how light polluted it is. Make sure you can get the gear working. Make sure your stars are round. Make sure you don't have any odd aberrations working its way in. And uh, the only other exception that I would say to that is something that uh, beginners probably won't come upon or won't be concerned with so much, but that's narrow band. And if you want to learn about let narrow band, there's your keyword. You'll see one of our look to one of our previous presentations, and you can learn a lot about narrow band and how you can get good images in light polluted skies. As you progress in your imaging, if you live in a light polluted area, narrow band's a great option. So it's a good thing to know right off the bat, but it's not a good thing to try right off the bat. But darker skies are best. Drive to darker skies. Light pollution creates noise and gradients. Gradients can be taken care of, but the noise that light pollution creates is actually really difficult to overcome. Um, we are coming upon galaxy season. So uh, for the people like me that shoot a lot of narrowband because we're in light polluted skies, um, we kind of dread this season because this means, okay, now I'm not going to be shooting from my... Most of the targets are RGB targets, non-narrowband targets. So I'm not going to be shooting great galaxies from my observatory here. If I want to get really nice images of galaxies, I've got to drive to darker skies. Um, the uh, 
as I said earlier, shoot away from the moon. Um, shoot dimmer objects during the new moon. Dim objects are galaxies, nebulae. Uh, brighter objects are globular clusters. Um, you can look at the magnitudes of the objects. If you have a imaging plan, which I actually suggest putting together, put 10 objects that you'd like to photograph on a list. Sort them in order of their brightness. And that way you can plan a little bit better. Um, planning actually has a lot to do with this. And uh, now, that I, now that I said that, I, I just remembered that I had planned to write up an entire slide on planning, but I forgot. So there, there you go. That's the best, uh, that's the best uh, argument for planning. Uh, what are the five Ps that I won't repeat right now. Um, another great thing to do, join a forum a club or a group, Yahoo group, a uh, local astronomy club, or a forum like Cloudy Nights, which is where you'll find a lot of us in the room here. Ask questions. Sometimes you may be asking these questions in an emergency, and frequently you'll get answers quickly. Uh, you, these days we have internet everywhere, even in some of the most remote sites. So, uh, hey, how do I do this? Hey, how do I do that? Well, you might get an answer within 30 minutes. But at the same time, when you're on the forum, help others. Uh, if you have a piece of gear and you know how it works, tell them what you think. Tell them what you know. Forums are a great place to share your images. People are going to point out things in your images that you don't see, whether it's a green tint, a gradient, vignetting. Uh, you, you just, every time someone points out something in my image, image and we we usually all approach the uh, the forums as, uh, hey, this is the image that I'm really, really proud on. Tear it apart. Tell me what's wrong with it. Because you're really going to be amazed by the talent and knowledge and, uh, I should say, the willingness to share uh, or to share knowledge in the community. Uh, we all want to make everyone better at astrophotography, and I think we have. Um, I have to give Cloudy Nights a whole lot of credit for how much better my images got. And I like to think uh, the Astro Imaging Channel is kind of doing the same. Um, I'll tell you there are, I don't know how many people are watching this video right now, but there are probably at least five people in this, in this live room right now. I don't know how many people are in this room. I might be undershooting it, but uh, there are probably five people in this room right now that are taking APOD quality images uh, probably today. But if you compare them to five years ago, well, they, they've blown away the APODs from five years ago. And it's just because of the sharing of knowledge. Um, the, the guys who were getting them five years ago shared their knowledge, and now we've learned. So uh, share your not Learn and share knowledge. Processing. Garbage in, garbage out. Uh, as I said earlier, integration time is very important. Lots and lots of sub-exposures. You want to take long exposures. The pros do 40 hours. I have kind of a lower limit on my images of about eight hours per image. Sometimes it's a little bit more for narrow band. Um, but whenever I'm under that, I, I, it makes processing a lot harder. And uh, garbage in, garbage out. Make sure your stars are round. If they're not round, uh, you're not going to have, well, you're not going to make them round by gathering more non-round subs. And one of the best tips that I've ever gotten is throwing away my bad frames. If I have a hundred frames, even if, even if I think most of them are good, very frequently throwing away the, the worst 20 of them will make my image better. So it's better to throw away bad frames than to use them. Now I'm not saying that's always the case. Stack all your frames, then throw away the best, uh, the worst 20, then stack those frames and see how it compares. But uh, the, more, the more I discriminate with my subs, the better my images have become. Noise reduction. Um, when I first got into the hobby and I was taking my one and a half hour exposures, or my, I should say, my total one and a half hour image, um, I was concentrating on noise reduction. I was paying $30 for this noise reduction tool, $40 for this noise reduction tool. And the truth is, noise reduction really just blurs. Noise reduction doesn't increase signal. 
on a very strong signaled image, noise reduction is a useful tool for making it a little bit prettier. But it's no solution for improving a bad image or improving a noisy image. The only way to improve a noisy image is to take more sub-exposures and add more time. In general, with processing, there are a lot of ways to get from A to B. You can pick your favorite program, Photoshop, PixInsight, Star Tools, and learn that program. You don't have to jump. You, don't, you buy Photoshop and you say, oh, my images aren't so good with Photoshop. Let me try PixInsight. Ah, oh, my images aren't so good with PixInsight. Let me try Star Tools. Oh, what, the, what am I doing wrong? Well, maybe it's just that you need a little bit more integration time, or maybe you just have to learn a little bit more about the program you're using. I, I, I still don't consider my expert, uh, myself an expert at any one of those tools, but every day I try something, I learn more, and um, I'll tell you, every presentation that I, I see Josh or David or Alex or any of the guys that are on here do, I learn something from every single presentation and sometimes it's really simple stuff. Sometimes it's a keyboard shortcut, but it, it in some cases it's, it's a technique that makes my image a lot better. And the key to that is practice. Knowing, uh, knowing how to do something is, is one part. Practicing and then practicing and then practicing, well that's how you get good at it. This is one thing that I think is really valuable. Maybe not on your first outing, maybe not on your second outing, but very shortly after you start to understand what you're doing, I suggest really getting a laptop. Now you, you could use a laptop in your first outing. In fact, I would say start with a laptop on your first outing, um, unless you just hate computers, I don't know. Uh, but then you might not be watching this video. Uh, so let's assume we're all proficient enough with computers that we can get onto YouTube or uh, Google. Well, getting onto YouTube is one thing. Getting onto Google Plus, well, geez, a lot of us still have trouble with that. Uh, but laptops, so DSLR screens are small and they're facing down. Uh, if I don't know if you're flexible enough that you can actually look either through the viewfinder of a DSLR or look at the back of the camera on the DSLR, well then I don't know. You're, you're more flexible than I am. Admittedly, I'm not very flexible. But, um, I mean, I, I just prefer to look at a laptop screen. I prefer to sit down, be comfortable, take my time, look at the laptop screen. You ha you'll be focusing. You'll be turning the focus knob while you're looking at the laptop screen. It's very hard to turn the focus knob while you're looking at the back of the camera. Um, you're also going to have to frame the image. So you're going to have to get your target in the center. It's hard to see the target in a short sub. On a laptop, you can do some stuff. You can stretch the image a little bit so you can see the target. And remember, laptops can trigger exposures just like you can by pressing the button on the DSLR. Um, if you have a CCD camera, which I'm, I'm not necessarily suggesting for a beginner, uh, there's no screen on it, so you need a laptop. So it's good to get into the habit of having that laptop. As well, laptops can run guiding, which you'll learn about in a sec. Polar alignment. There are polar alignment routines that use laptops. We saw one two weeks ago that is probably the most amazing product of 2016. Um, laptops can help with troubleshooting. You can see elongated stars on a laptop much easier than you can on the back of the camera. Uh, you can review your, sub, your images as they come in, your sub-exposures as they come in. And automation, well, we're, we're going to get to that in a second. But first, auto-guiding. You will be auto-guiding. Uh, the mount only tracks so well, we need to lock onto a star. Uh, so auto-guiding lets your mount, takes a normal mount and makes it track like a premium mount. And you need great tracking to take good images. Uh, so auto-guiding is what gets you to that great tracking. There are a few things to keep in mind, or at least a few keywords you want to know about when you're auto-guiding, or, or really just in general, uh, but field rotation. So you lock on a star. Well, first of all, field rotation is due to polar misalignment. Again, polar aligning, uh, you're centering on Polaris. That's one keyword to look up. Um, you're, you're centering the rotational axis of your mount on Polaris. 
Um, most mounts have a polar alignment routine, uh, but we're always polar misaligned to some degree. In most cases, it doesn't. Uh, well, we try for good enough polar alignment that it doesn't matter. If you have polar misalignment that does matter, then it shows up in your images as rotation around the guide star. Guide star. So every uh, so the image, if you look at the corners of it, it'll look like it's circular. It'll look like the entire field is rotating around the center of the image. Um, that's what we call field rotation. Uh, at the same time, there's something called differential flexure, and this is another product of auto guiding or product that can happen when you're auto guiding. It's due to the very slight flexing of the system as it tracks across the sky. So your imaging tube, your imaging telescope is tracking across the sky, and if you're using a piggyback guider or you're guiding with a different telescope, um, that second telescope may flex slightly off from the primary telescope. It only has to be very, very slight to cause issues, and it shows up as elongated stars. Uh, this will show up differently whether you're using, uh, depending on whether you're using a piggyback guiding setup or an OAG or an off-axis guider as it's uh, called. Um, a lot of beginners start with piggyback guiding. Some people uh, progress on to off-axis guiders. Some people say that beginners shouldn't start with off-axis guiders. I'm not going to go into many of the details of the differences between the two, but those are two more keywords for you to check out. And I, I want to say, I don't know if we did a presentation on that specifically, but we've talked about that in different presentations. Um, guide cameras have come a long way in the last five years, so I've seen a migration of a lot, of pe a lot more people being willing to start with an off-axis guider as their first auto-guiding solution. And I'm coming to the point where I am kind of saying to beginners, if, if you think you can, you might want to start with an off-axis guider. It can eliminate differential flexure, which really is a big problem. Um, it also gives you better guiding. But you're going to have to... Uh, you're going to have to do your own research on that. And we literally could talk for half an hour on that alone. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. Automation. As I said earlier, automation is the ultimate goal. It may not be your ultimate goal, but um, if you want better images, if you want more images in less time, well, then it is the ultimate goal. It allows you to sleep while you're taking your images. Or maybe I should reverse that. It, it allows you to take more images while you're sleeping because uh, I can't stay up all night. Uh, I have to go to work in the morning. I have to, uh, I don't know, lots of stuff can happen. So what automation does is it allows you to sleep. And, um, you know, there's all different levels of automation. Some people automate with um, an intervalometer that you attach to your DSLR, but I automate using my laptop, and I use Sequence Generator Pro. Uh, but there are different levels of automation. Sometimes you might want to just automate your sub-exposures, have it repeat the same exposure over and over and over and over again. Sometimes you might want it to repeat that exposure over and over and over again, and then switch to a different target, which takes uh, a few more steps. Automation in general, though, um, does a few things. Primarily, it it prevents a lot of, well, I shouldn't say primarily, but it prevents a lot of those three in the morning mistakes. Uh, I've done this before. You, before I was fully automated, uh, you go outside to do something and you mess it up and you get frustrated and you break down because you're so frustrated. Well, this takes stupid out of the equation. And uh, Right now I'm pointing at myself because I'm stupid. Uh, not, I'm not saying I'm stupid, but it's usually me that's making the mistakes. It's rarely the program that's making the mistakes. Uh, and a mistake can be kicking the, accidentally kicking the tripod while you're pulled or aligned. A mistake can be accidentally hitting the slew button 
when you're already t framed on your target. There are a lot of stupid things you can do at 3 a.m. that'll get you so frustrated and just you'll say to yourself, well, I don't want to do this all over again. I'm just going to break down. But automation does take time to get working because you do have to kind of build up to it. And the more you want to automate, the more you have to build up to, optimize, and get working. But eventually, automation can trigger your exposures. It can handle autofocusing. It can slew and plate solve. So it can slew to your target and then make sure it's exactly centered on your target, exactly how you want it. It can start guiding, it can stop guiding, um, it can unpark and park your mount, it can even open and close your observatory. So literally, you can have a system that doesn't involve you at all except for setting it up. And when I first started out, that wasn't quite a goal of mine, but now I really think that that's just the way to get more images in, in less time. I have a few, this is one of those sidebars, I have a few rules to upgrading and these are my upgrade rules. I don't always stick to them but when I don't it kinda bites me in the butt. And the primary one is one item at a time. When you upgrade, which you're gonna do, try and upgrade one item at a time. Whenever I've upgraded, uh, say, this scope and this camera and the auto guider all at the same time, an image, uh, excuse me, an issue sneaks up. And that issue is really hard to identify if you've upgraded three, three pieces of equipment. Is there, I don't know, is it coming from the focuser on the new telescope, or is it an issue with the guide camera, or is it an issue with your new mount, or is it an issue with the weight? You never really know. And unfortunately in this hobby, I'm not going to say nothing works out of the box, even though that's what I typed, but not everything works out of the box, and almost everything can be or needs to be optimized. One good way to work your way through an upgrade is find someone with a similar system because where when I said nothing work nothing always works out of the box and everything can be optimized well sometimes items just won't work together and one of the primary things that I think of when it comes to that is back focus sometimes you can't just attach a camera to a telescope without concerning yourself with back focus especially if you're either off-axis guiding or using a particular group of items, back focus is one of those things you have to pay attention to. So finding someone with a similar system and that's working um, is a good way to be sure that it's going to work. And then if it doesn't work, you know, you can bother, you can drive the manufacturer nuts because you say, well, it's working for this guy, and they'll say, oh yeah, well, he's doing this. But uh, you'd hate to bother the manufacturer if it's something you're doing wrong. Uh, they'll always answer your questions, but they might not take back a return if you're screwing it up. Uh, as well, Meridian issues are just one of the other way, it, things that popped into my mind. Um, you buy a mount, you buy a long telescope, uh, you have a specific tripod, sometimes you may not be able to photograph what's directly overhead because your camera will bump into either a tripod leg or, um, or the, the base of the mount. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Some travel tips, because you're going to be driving to darker skies. Make a list. Um, I haven't had too many horror stories, but I've had a few. And uh, the at first, I really needed the list. Now what I've actually done is um, I have a specific way I keep my gear attached and break my gear down and put it into my boxes that if I'm missing something it's not in the particular spot of my box so I know that I'm missing it and it's probably sitting on my desk. I'm still gonna forget things but it's really eliminated a lot of my issues, a lot of my forgetting things issues. Uh, most recently my last issue was I couldn't find my um, um, counterweight bar and I was looking all over it wasn't in the box where I usually store it I couldn't figure out where I put it 
and I drove home to get it because I was sure I left it on my desk or so, sitting somewhere around. And as I pulled into my driveway at home, I realized that I left it on my mount, which was 45 minutes away. And it was uh, one of those stupid, stupid things I did. Um, another travel tip, bring backups, especially cables, because cables are cheap. Uh, batteries, just make sure you have form of power. Uh, if you don't have two batteries, maybe you want to bring, uh, well, you probably have your car, so you can always use your lighter outlet, but make sure you have the cables that will get from your car to your mount. Uh, another thing is driver and recovery discs for your laptop. Always keep those on hand because they, they crash, and we, we put our laptops through heck. So uh, you want to have that stuff on hand, especially if you're going on a two- or three-day trip. Uh, we've all had that experience where something goes wrong, and you have to reinstall something, and it's just a pain if you have that. And sometimes you don't have internet on your laptop where you're going. We usually have internet on our phones, but that doesn't always solve our problem. So uh, make sure you, you, you bring as much stuff as you can remember. If you're going on a long trip, do a driveway dry run. Set everything up in your driveway, not in your... Not where you normally do it. Set it up right next to your car and make sure it's working right next to your car so that as you break it down, put it right into your car because if you do it where you're normally observing, you might put it on your typical seat or your table or in your observatory. As a beginner, you might not have an observatory. But just make sure it goes right into the car. That way, if it's not sitting on the driveway next to your car, then it's in your car and you're ready to go. This is one tip that doesn't just apply to astrophotography. This applies to life. This applies to vacations. This applies to basically everything. If you are considering bringing or doing something, bring or do it. Because if you don't, you're going to be so upset with yourself when it turns out you really could have used it. You know, this involves eyepieces. Let's say you're going on an imaging trip and it's a little cloudy. It's not totally cloudy, but it's cloudy enough that you can't image. Well, if you brought your eyepieces, you'd have something to do, but you didn't bring your eyepieces. You thought about it, but you didn't because, well, those, uh, I don't know, those, uh, what is it, maybe five, ten square inches? Oh, I needed that storage space. No. Throw it in your car. Fit it in your car somehow. Get if you're considering it, bring it. I don't care what it is. Most importantly, have fun. If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. And I can say this. This is one of my first images of the Whirlpool Galaxy. And this is a, a pretty bad image. But I took this image, and I was jumping up and down. I was so happy with it. I couldn't believe that I could photograph a galaxy like that from my driveway. Um, I took this image, I jumped up and down, I, I ran inside to, to get my wife, I was, I was really, really new at this, I, I wanted her to come running out and say, and I stopped as I was running inside and I ran back outside and I said, wait, do I need to put the lens cap back on my telescope while I'm leaving it out here? So I put the lens cap back on my telescope and I ran inside to get my wife and I had her come out, she came outside, I took the lens cap off my telescope, I triggered another exposure and I got another image of Andromeda and, and uh, the, I don't know, it, it set me off. And uh, most recently, I was working on this image and uh, I'll tell you, this one really stood out to me. I had a lot of fun while I was doing this. I was in darker skies, I was just trying to get my time in between uh, the, the the terrible weather that I was getting, but I just had a lot of fun, and I still am having a lot of fun whenever I do this. Of course, this winter's dr this winter drove me nuts because it was nice and warm, but it was cloudy every single day. I think I got like three days in this winter. Uh, finally, I feel like we've had a break in the weather, and I'm about to finish up my first image in maybe a month and a half, but I'm still having fun, and that's the most important thing. So that's all for now, but... Anyone in the room that has tips, uh, feel free to share them. I'm going to take my camera back. Let's we got a lot of questions out there, Adam. Okay. And I am sorry for not asking if you... Let me take my camera back here. I'm sorry for uh, not coming back here. 
Okay, I'm going to start at the top because I can go right down this, and the top might not be the way they were answered. Does the guide scope have to look at the same spot as your main scope? It's good to have the guide scope look at the same spot as your main scope, uh, basically at the center of it. Um, if your guide scope is looking at the corner of your image or well off to the side, then that field rotation that I was talking about is going to make the lines go right through your target. If you're pointed at the center of your um, imaging scope, then the field rotation will at least stay in the corners. Now hopefully you're not going to have field rotation, but it's just a good practice to do it that way. And I'll tell you something, if you have a guide scope or a piggyback guide scope, it's pretty easy to identify where the center of your image is. Try and align them and try and keep them well aligned, but just a really good practice to do it that way. Um, how do you avoid do on a laptop? Uh, you have an outdoor case for your Windows tablet, but not uh, search. Not sure if that's long enough in the long run. Um, okay, how expensive is your Windows tablet? Uh, Windows tablet, it could be a, a Surface or something. I don't know. If it's expensive, well, then yeah, keep the do off of it. Um, I have, I was joking about this the other day, I have a stack of laptops here. The laptop I'm using is 10 years old, and I don't really care so much about do. Uh, that said, uh, it gets pretty wet out there. So you can put a towel over it. Uh, you want, um, in the winter, I don't mind putting a towel over it uh, and then putting a bag over it. In the summer, you kind of want to let the heat dissipate out of it. So you could just put a bag over it and let the fan expose. But dew is, uh, dew is both uh, kind of damaging to electronics, but also just kind of part of what we do. It's going to happen. Can, uh, I, can I say something here, Adam? Go ahead, Al. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with dew. My method of getting rid of, of dew is to image in Southern California, and it works fairly effectively. But um, one of the other things you've got to worry about with uh, laptops is light spillover. Particularly if you're out with other uh, image, well, not without with other imagers because they don't seem to care. But quite often you'll be at a star party with other uh, 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 visual observers, and the visual observers, yeah, they do get pretty upset with your with your light. I'm not going to go into everything you need to control your light, but you realize that many of the things that you need to control light, you actually um, will help you control do putting it in one of those little baby tents. Uh, they make a little tent that's just the size of a laptop, and then you can open up the front, and it kind of keeps a warm space around the, um, the computer. A lot of people take a box, just a simple box big enough to hold your computer, and then um, you put the box on its side so that at the top um, lets you see the monitor. I mean, the, uh, you know, things like that. And those kinds of things can help with do. But again, I'm not a do expert. I've just uh, heard, you know seen that used in a few cases. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a couple comments here. So typically, uh, what I have is I have a, a you know fairly large black tub that I bought at Walmart or yeah. someplace like that, right? You know, and I used it for transporting things, and then I turned it on the side, and now I have a, a dew protection and light shield uh, for my laptop, and I typically have some heavy heavy material that goes over the the front. So when, at night I can get under it like a hood, and I still don't, you know, still shielded from uh, from all the other observers on the field, and that that works extremely well for keeping uh, dew and everything off their, off your equipment. Now I'll add one more thing to that, uh, not because you guys just made me remember one thing. Uh, Windows laptop um, on your power settings, make sure that you uh, change the power so settings so that when you close the lid, it does nothing. It doesn't shut down. Actually, when you're doing astrophotography, uh, you basically want to turn off um, any standby modes or anything like that uh, so that when you do close the lid as well, it doesn't either put it into standby or shut it down. I, I think basically all the versions of Windows, it, they say do nothing. Um, and that way, uh, you got your framing done, you've got your everything done, uh, and that way you could close the lid and walk away. A lot of us, uh, particularly, well, doing it from home, if you have a router, you can use TeamViewer so that you can actually 
log into your uh, laptop from either a separate laptop or a cell phone that may be inside your house or maybe next to your bed. Um, so uh, it, it's kind of combining the automation with, uh, with that. But uh, also with Do, you close the lid. And Do mostly, I, I don't know if Do necessarily falls or if it's just the humidity uh, that's uh, developing on anything that's facing the sky. But um, it's, when you close the lid, your keyboard is pretty safe from Do. Uh, the humidity can still make it inside the, the laptop and uh, hit the uh, mess with the interior of it, but at least we're protecting ourselves a little bit better. How do we submit pictures for the photo of the week? Uh, we will reshare the event. Uh, this is really confusing. Maybe I'll take a few seconds to uh, explain it. There is an event. Um, it's called the... Excuse me for one second. I'm going to go check what it's called. It's, uh, it's the image of the week, and um, Adam, I'll come on, uh, comment on this also. Um, we, we also have a Facebook page, um, and we, until we get our website up and running, we may shift the image of the week over to the Facebook page. Uh, seems like we get a little more action on images there, and it's a lot easier to actually submit them. And the great thing about the Facebook page is, at that point, everybody can actually see the image of the, or all the images that are submitted, which is the fun part of it, is seeing everybody's images uh, easily. So look forward to that. We have an image of the week this week already, um, so we'll invite uh, Nicholas Kazillion on to come describe his uh, picture of IC443 next week, but then I think starting next week we're going to transition over to Facebook for submissions of image of the week. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. Google Plus really makes it difficult for us to share the images that way. Um, so hopefully the, the new plan will work for us well. Uh, meet up at NIAC. So I'm unfortunately not able to go to NIAC. I have well, so much going on at work, and um, my wife and kids wouldn't be happy with me. Um, but uh, if there, if a few of you guys are, uh, if a few of you guys are going to be at NIAC, um, or NIF, uh, for that matter, uh, drop me either a message here. I'm going to NEF on Sunday. Drop me either a message here on Google Plus or on Cloudy Nights or on our website, theastroimagingchannel.com. You can um, go to the Contact Us. Just let me know. And if, if I get one or two or three or however many people, then uh, maybe I'll try and put something together. I'll post it on Google Plus. I'll, I'll let everyone know. Uh, but that would be a good idea. Um, my, uh, Mike ha has uh, Mike is an artist has an LED light panel for drawing. Will that work for taking flats? It's about the size of a tablet, and his scope is a four-inch refractor. If it's evenly illuminated, I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, in fact, uh, the, the the only comment on that Adam would just be that it has to be actually uh, white light which a lot of times those LEDs aren't necessarily white, so you may get a jump in the spectrum on that. Uh, one, one thing that helps, it, if it's not perfectly even illumination, if you have some sort of diffuser, a T-shirt or sheet or paper, you know, a couple sheets of paper in between, that will really help even out the light. Yep. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, Mike, with a, uh, as Josh said, uh, if it's not balanced between all the three color channels, then uh, it can cause issues. So basically you'll see one of the channels spiked way far away from the, uh, whether it's the red channel or the green channel or the blue channel, one of them will not align with the others, and that can cause problems because it takes one of those channels possibly out of the linear range, and it's important to have flats well within the linear range uh, of our sensor. Um, but that said, try it. It'll probably work. <laughs> and if it doesn't, you'll know. I use an iPad for my um, AMP 120, uh, 101, and uh, my TV 85. Um, and the iPad, I, I do uh, just, uh, I made a little foam attachment so that it'll uh, stay on the front, and I just put it on the front, and off it goes. Works fine. Yeah, this comment just popped up from Greg Marshall. He says, LED panels are rarely flat enough for calibration. Uh, which does mean you probably have to use a diffuser. Um, 
you can get creative, and you can. Um, uh, so basically, instead of just putting a few sheets of diffusing paper in front of it, if you allow some space yeah. between the LED panel and the paper, then it'll allow the light to spread out and give you a flatter field. Uh, that's kind of the principle I used to use with my uh, my old flat box. It was two feet long. Uh, you probably wouldn't need something two feet long, but I used a tap light, like one of those little... Very easy, very simple. Uh, my only problem was uh, for an SCT, it, it, I used to have to sit it, buckle it into my front seat to take it with me. It was, it was kind of big. Um, David, let's do another image challenge too. Yes, uh, I've been saving that. Next week's NEAF, uh, depending on uh, what we're coming up with, uh, I'll try and have something come together. Um, if anyone out there has any good ideas for image challenges, if anybody has either some great data or some troublesome data, and they wanted to do an imaging challenge with it, uh, let me know. Um, and uh, I see, Mike, you're posting the link to it. I'm, I'm not 100% certain. I will check on that in one second. Uh, just knocking some of these down. Um, what is a good, what a good, uh, what's a good ba backup battery for beginners? Uh, basically, most of our stuff runs off 12-volt batteries, and typically you're going to hear us all talk about deep cycle um, batteries, which come in all different ranges of amp hours. Depending on how much equipment you're powering, that's going to determine how many amp hours you want. Um, and it's good to have... So deep cycles can be drained more than typical car batteries. It's still not a good idea to drain them all the way down, but they can be drained below 50%, uh, whereas with car batteries, you really don't want to drain them below 50%. Um, so I'm going to say find a, a deep cycle marine RV battery and um, mine that I take out that I'm comfortable using for about one and a half nights of imaging is 105 amp hours, but that's because I'm running uh, a relatively large mount a USB hub, a camera with cooling, um, a focuser, um, occasionally a laptop, uh, and a few other items. Um, so it really depends on how much power you're using. Um, but if you're doing it for one night, uh, a 50 amp hour probably would be sufficient. Uh, that said, it, it really does depend on how much power you're using. And you might have to, <laughs> in this hobby, you're going to become uh, uh, knowledgeable of a lot of, about a lot of different things. I've never learned so much about wattage and amperage and voltage and uh, uh, DC current as I, as I have because I got into this hobby. But uh, once, you, once you have the need, you have to learn. That's the way this, this works. Uh, and David, I see the same question from David coming in. Neef, we'll, we'll get that figured out. I'm going. I'll be there. And I'll be reporting back on that next week, as I said. Um, uh. Hi. Can I uh, share something? I think I've got my screen share going. Can you see it? Yes. Guys? Yeah, okay. Uh, a lot of people like these uh, Celestron power tanks, and there are various uh, versions of this. You can get a, a starter power pack, uh, but you'll notice the price on these things, 124 bucks, 125 bucks, etc., etc. If you don't need the big spotlight, and there's a good chance you won't, if you don't need, if you don't need the radio, if you don't need all the stuff that comes along with it, these things are basically batteries that you can buy for anywhere from 18 to 20 bucks. Here's a couple over here. Uh, here's a 12-volt, 8-amp hour um, uh, for 35 bucks. That's what's at the bottom of those, uh, of those big power tanks over here. All right? And they're a lot smaller, a lot cheaper, and a lot easier to carry around. All you need to do is go down to Walmart or someplace and get yourself a cigarette converter, um, and it plugs onto these two little posts right here, and everything's cool. Um, so that's a good backup battery for a lot of people. 
try to get one again that's deep cycle like they were talking about. By the way, I found this right now by Googling sealed lead acid battery. And that's all you really got to do to uh, get into this kind of stuff. It's a good backup battery. However, if you're going to be out for any length of time, you do want to consider getting the RV battery type, uh, the, the, the deep cycle RV batteries. The problem you've got with that is that the ones we normally buy for about 120 bucks or something like that, 80 to 120 bucks down at Walmart, um, they leak. And that's not something you can mess around with. If you don't have some place to store it, take care of it, it's not something you want just carrying around in your car. They're also very heavy. But if you want to make it through a couple of nights, you're probably going to need one of those in the way of a backup battery. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, and we've done um, another presentation on power solutions. I think it was, I think the title was something like power solutions or powering. I, I'll, I'll try. You can look through our presentations either on YouTube. All of our past presentations are on YouTube. You'll find it because um, there is a lot you'll have to learn about batteries and how to get in some cases, the power from the battery to the mount. Because, mm -hmm. as you saw the, on those SLAs, either they didn't have a cigarette lighter. And some people don't like cigarette lighters. You know, you bump the cigarette lighter the wrong way, and uh, it restarts your mount. And restarting your mount means yeah. you have to redo the polar alignment routine, or you have to redo the, cali uh, the um, star sync routine, or the star alignment routine. But those are but those are what you get on your Celestron power packs, where you know you're 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 going down up a cigarette lighter, but that doesn't mean you can't uh, you know tape it down and wire it down and put all sorts of power posts on it. But you ask for a nice simple backup power solution. I advise you that those sealed lead acid batteries are really good for a night maybe, with your DSLR and your laptop working on its own most of the time. I also found it's handy to have a. a a, a, a computer um, power uh, inverter so it goes from 12 up to the 18 volts so that you don't have to go up to 110 volts and then back down to, um, to if your laptop doesn't want to run all night okay so that's something that, that would be good if you're if you're thinking about power solutions it's good though to run it at home before you go out there and make sure that it will last through the night if you're going to, if you're planning on imaging all night. Yep. And Frank's, uh, Frank Clore is making a good suggestion out here. Has a good suggestion. Use a marine battery enclosure if you're buying one of those RV batteries. Yes. Um, first of all, because they leak, as Alex said, but also uh, a lot of the marine enclosures have a built-in cigarette lighter, or as I did, you can drill a hole in the side and you can install a, distri a power distribution panel on it. A lot of us use power poles. I never quite understood power poles until I started using them. And then all of a sudden, it was like an aha moment. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is why. And it's just a lot easier. Uh, in fact, you bump the cigarette lighter once, and then all of a sudden, uh, you, uh, you know why. Um, do we have any tips regarding cable management? Um, OK, that, <laughs> that could almost get its own full presentation, but with cable management, uh, I have tons and tons of Velcro ties, and I always try and Velcro it to something that's more rigid, and I always try and keep uh, kind of a few uh, uh whether it be near the uh, battery or up at the top, where uh, if you do pull it away, you're not yanking on the top, so kind of where it breaks away. Um, but you... you uh, Velcro it down up at the top. Uh, it, it really depends on which cable. Uh, coming off your camera, you can Velcro it to um, your... Uh, it also depends on, I guess, your telescope, because I'm thinking Schmidt. On my uh, schmidt Cassegrain, I Velcro it to the uh, uh, T-adapter, and I run it through my mount. Uh, not everyone has through-the-mount cabling, you know, that's one of those things we could have a full presentation on. It's really hard to give you any specifics on that. Um, in your in your case, uh, the SLR cable pulled away, caused issues because it wasn't fixed anywhere, just hanging. Don't let your cables just hang. They should always be attached to something. In fact, hanging cables will ca cause differential flexure, and that's what I was speaking about earlier. Uh, they should 
really always be uh, run up against something. There are certain axes where you can't have it running right against, but there are other places where you uh, you really should have it so that it's just not dangling there. Uh, gravity's tugging on it a little bit this way, a little bit that way. Um, could, I, could I describe what I do with a German equatorial mount? Yeah. And I assume most of us, many of us do use German equatorial mounts. So, up at the top, uh, depending on what your, where your guider is and things like that, you've got a guider, a camera, maybe a focuser. you got three or four cables for power, whatever you've got, everything's up there. Plug them all in and grab them uh, oh, and somehow attach your camera so that your camera, even if it comes out of its um, of of its holder of the fill, of the focuser, even if it drops out of the focuser, is still attached with strap or something like that. But at any rate, you get all your cab cables and you tie them together with one of those Velcro straps, right at the right at the point where you meet the dovetail. Then from the dovetail run all those cables that are all tied together now up to a point right above your declination and then tie it again right there where your declination axis is about to turn. Then get a loop big enough that it can go from one extension of your declination axis all the way around to the other and tie that right above your right ascension axis. I, as a matter of fact, use the hole that um, is supposed to hold my my um, uh, um, uh, uh, my polar alignment po uh, telescope. Okay, there. I just uh, made a little bracket, or I can tie it right to that little knob right there that usually sticks there. And then I have a, a a loop big enough that no matter where my right ascension axis goes, um, I I can it can move. So I've only got two free loops. Both those loops are designed so that they're only long enough to go as far as the declination axis or the RA can send it. And then it goes back down below and, and connects to whatever it needs to connect to. And again, they're all cabled together as far as they can go. Um, so that I've really got one cable bundle doing the whole thing. Now watch out. Don't make your cable bundle too thick if you can help it. Now since we're talking to beginners here, I'd suggest you go there. There are other ways to do it by putting your um, USB 4-in-1 splitter up at the top and having only one cable come down and stuff like that. But that's a little more advanced and you don't need to really worry about it now. Now um, that's one thing I've found with cables is you really only need two places where you've got movement. Every place you don't have movement you shouldn't have any slack or any more slack than is necessary uh, to, to uh, reach the cameras and things like that. One other thing, I know that it's very popular to get optional add-on knobs and um, uh, you know so you can have no tool hands uh, control of your mount when you're putting it together. Los Mondi has particularly got some very very nice knobs that really can reach out and grab cables. You don't need those hands those tool-free knobs most of the time. Uh, it's safer for, for if you're going to have cable problems to take the tool and that way you don't have knobs sticking out trying to grab things as they go by. And just now I'm sharing uh, Eric Coles just uh, put up a link to this. This is his system and of course you're looking at a pretty nice distribution system there between power up top, USB, uh, dew heater, Focus controller. Uh, I don't even know what the thing on the bottom there is. Hey, Adam. <clears throat> I, I, I posted the link to... There are two great threads on Cloudy Nights about your imaging train, empowering your gear, and cable, cable management. I posted both links to those in the comments for the video. So if anyone is curious and wants to look through there, there's probably over 100 images of really good... Um, imaging trains and how people are actually managing their cables and actually shows details and actual specific parts that people are using. So it's kind of hard to describe stuff compared to actually looking at pictures. So this will be really helpful for people. Great. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, and as you see, you can see this uh, Eric's system right here. And even though Eric's mount does have through-the-mount cabling, it looks like he may not be using it in, in, 
and you can see how he's running his cables and has them passing them. And there is a complete link in the description, so maybe I will share his uh, link in the comments as well. And you can uh -huh. see that he's got a loop coming from up above, and then it then it hits the top of the uh, above the uh, RA axis, and then there's another loop coming down to give freedom for the uh, RA axis, and that's the only two loops that he's got that uh, can get confused. He's got except for the spaghetti up at the top, but they're all only so so long. Awesome. Well, uh, okay. I mean, that's basically it. Uh, like I said, uh, hopefully some of you guys are on the forums. Ask your questions there. You'll check out some more stuff in the comments. We're going to be doing more of this stuff. So, uh, wow, I had hoped to keep this short. And wow, we ended up going an hour and 15 minutes. Oh, no. Yeah, an hour and 15 minutes, a little bit longer than I was planning. But there was a lot of good information here. So thank you guys for asking your questions. Thank you all for in the room for sharing uh, all that information. And... Um, I think basically we'll see you next week, or maybe I'll see you at Neath, and uh, I will post shortly uh, about next week's session again. Again, Neath recap, and maybe the the week after session. But thanks for coming, and uh, thanks guys in the room again, and uh, have a good night. <laughs>